let's talk about the video game Planescape Torment. Planescape Torment is one of the best video games ever made without exception, without reference to any genre specifically, just in general one of the greatest video games ever made. It would be on the top 10 list, I think, if anyone was being objective, maybe even on the top 5 list. It's on my top 5 games ever made. It is fantastic, and let's talk about it. The game is very odd in that it tells the story of a person that can't be killed. Your character can't die, so no matter what you do, no matter how much you screw up, your character is always going to come back to life again afterwards, because that's the strange part about this game. You're not fighting to stay alive. You're fighting for the right to die, which is a perfect example of the Planescape universe turning everything on its head. You're not fighting to stay alive against terrible odds. You're fighting to find a way to end your immortality. Immortality seems like something that most people would want to achieve in a video game, but this guy realizes how hellish it is and wants it to stop. The game begins with the most cliched story idea ever, in that you're a man with amnesia who wakes up without knowing anything about where he is, who he is, or what's going on. But this game, because it's so good, it uses this cliché brilliantly, and you're actually fascinated in what this guy is doing here, and why, and what's going on with him. You are covered in scars. In fact, you might even say that your entire body is made of grayish scar tissue. And you want to know how in the heck you got here. You wake up in a mortuary in the city of Sigil, which I've already discussed in my previous videos. Your initial quest is simply to find out who you are, and what you're doing there, and how you died, or came to think, or somebody came to think that you were dead and put you in the mortuary. And the journey he goes on is fascinating, because he encounters some of the most interesting characters in video game history. A and they're some of the most unique characters. It's not just the standard RPG thing, because this is Planescape, and they're not fucking around. They have to be creative in order to be in Planescape. And so instead of running into the standard dwarf, elf, halfling, blah blah blah, you run into a, your first companion is a talking skull. Yeah, named Morty, and he's a wisecracker, too, and he's really funny. And then you run into a Githzerai, and the Githzerai are a fascinating, a really interesting race that uh, it's really exciting just to learn about them. I love talking about them. They're really, really fun. Uh, you also run into a Tiefling, which was more unusual back then than it is now. Now Tieflings are a standard part of D&D. Back then it was a little unusual. Uh, tiefling is a half-human, half-demon or devil. And the Tiefling Anna is uh, initially pretty hostile to you, uh, but she's an interesting character, heavily sexualized, and, you know, why not? I mean, she's a pretty sexy character. Uh, you also run into a succubus. Uh, however, the succubus is, because this is Planescape, the succubus, the demon, uh, or devil, I think, actually, uh, is actually the nicest character in the game. Yeah, think about that. The demon is the nicest character in the entire game. She's the only one that shows you any kindness or compassion. Uh, you also run into a rogue Modron, which is, so I'll talk about him later. He's sort of like a sentient robot, uh, although he's not exactly a robot. He's organic, but he thinks in a very robotic sort of way. It's a fascinating game. The characters, unlike in other games where they're very stock and very standard or playing, you know, even if they are different, they're playing with very standard tropes, like in Dragon Age. You know, even in the first game where that, the characters were actually interesting, unlike in the second game, the characters are, you know, they're kind of basic. There's nothing too strange about them. And when they go different, they really go different and outside of fantasy tropes. You know, just to give you an example, in Dragon Age 2, there is a, uh, a character that you, uh, a companion character that you get who is a dwarf, and he doesn't have a beard, and he uses a bow. Yeah, that's it. That's his entire character, and that's exactly what they thought. That's how far outside of the box they went with that character. He's a dwarf, but instead of an axe, he's the one that uses a bow, and he, he doesn't have a beard, and he has a shirt buttoned down to his belly button, or you know, that's the limit of the creativity nowadays of Bioware. You know, they, they very slightly change a very standard character into another very standard character. There's nothing unique about them, but the characters in this game are fascinating. Just talking to them is really interesting. In the Dragon Age and other games, talking to the characters doesn't feel interesting because they're not exciting, they're not different, they're not new. But these characters, I actually enjoy spending a lot of time talking with them. The quest that you end up going on will take you across all of the planes of existence, going to various iterations of hell and strange prison planes and 
all through the city of Sigil, exploring different areas about it. And going there is so exciting and so fun. And learning who you are, you get to learn some of the mysteries of the universe. That's how deep it is. You're not trying to save the universe from some great calamity. You're not trying to destroy the ring and mortar. You're not trying to save the planet or whatever. It goes deeper than that. It gets more metaphysical than that. You get to learn some of the secrets of existence playing this game. It's so fun to learn them. It's so refreshing that your quest is essentially a quest for knowledge. It's not trying to save somebody. It's not taking on that extremely tiresome uh, quest for revenge. By the way, game developers, please stop making revenge uh, a plot device in your games. It is totally disinteresting and completely boring. Uh, this character's quest to simply gain knowledge about himself, about life, the universe, and everything is really exciting and fun, and all of the mysteries that are still there at the end are all really fun, too. Now, this game takes one of those interesting approaches to alignment in the world, and I plan to talk about Dungeons & Dragons and alignment at some point, but just to very briefly go into it, most Dungeons & Dragons game when they assign you an alignment that is a moral point of view about the world, that's something that you have when you start playing the game. Uh, in other words, when you start adventuring, you're either lawful good, a crusader of peace and happiness and wonderfulness, or chaotic evil, a monstrous, joker-like evil villain character who wants to hurt and burn and slay everything around them. But Planescape Torment asks, uh, uh, does it in a much more intelligent way, in that you start out true neutral. Not because you are true neutral, but because you haven't done anything. And you only earn your alignment by going towards certain directions. You, know, you can become lawful good by behaving lawful good. It's not like a class or a race that you're born with. Those are things that you, you know, you're, you're, not your class, but your race is something that you're born into. You can't change it. It's like your hair color or your eye color. But alignment, if done much more intelligently, you can become a chaotic evil maniac. And strangely enough, the game works perfectly either way, as a really good guy or a really evil guy, or as a completely crazy, insane maniac kind of guy. It works anyway. As you explore Sigil, you learn more about your past, and learn that you made some sort of devil's bargain years or centuries ago uh, with an extremely powerful witch named Ravel. And Ravel puzzle well, and you know that should give you an example of the game's interest in secrets and mysteries, apparently took your morality, uh, excuse me, it took your mortality away from you. It actually severed the mortality that you had, your, uh, your ability to die and leave this world, and made it its own separate entity. And you're actually combating your own mortality in, throughout the game and have to fight it and bring it back into you and become mortal again so you can uh, essentially die, as I said. That's pretty fascinating. The City of Sigil has never looked better, and this is a perfect postcard for anybody who is trying to get somebody else into the game. If you don't want to play the tabletop game, give them this, and they can maybe become more interested in it by exploring the city. It's fascinating, it's fun, it's exciting, and it is really enjoyable. It is one of the most mature games I've ever played, along with Silent Hill 2. It's one of the best stories, and one of the most intelligent. A central question that the game asks is, what can change the nature of a man? What can make a man different? What can alter who he is? What can change his morality, change who he is in the universe? And trying to answer that question, which you answer yourself, the game doesn't provide the answer for you, is one of part of the fascinating journey that you're of, of knowledge that your character goes on. So many games are about struggling to survive or revenge, but your character doesn't really change from beginning to end. This, in this game, you change a hell of a lot from beginning to end in learning who you are, who the characters around you are, and how the people around you have suffered. The, uh, the, even the NPCs, the, even the, the characters that aren't part of your party, are still explored in depth, including one named Dianara that you meet very early, and hers is one of the most tragic stories in any video game ever, and it is really, really exciting to see her. And speaking of Dianara, Dianara's theme is one of the greatest pieces of video game music I've ever heard, and the soundtrack to this game is perfect. It doesn't have that antiquated, traditionalist medieval music that played in, in, in 90s games, you know, with the mandolin and the lute and the lyre and so forth. Now, Bart, would you care to listen to me play the lute? Uh, sure. Come home, my bonny warrior, for now the nets are full of fish. And it doesn't have that 
very modernist kind of Celtic world mixed with symphonic music that uh, the Lord of the Rings movies uh, started. Uh, one of the th strange static aspects of RPG games over the past decade or so has been the music. It's really taken its cue from the Lord of the Rings movies and hasn't moved from there. But this game, since it was made before that, is fascinating. It's got this classical element, but also acoustic guitar and also electronic a bit in there. It's also got a, a weird Middle Eastern influence. The, the, game, the, the music really makes the game feel like you're in an alien world that's totally different from any other fantasy setting that you've been in before. Now, I've gushed about the game a little bit too much. Let's talk about the problems, and fanboys of the game don't like to talk about it, and I am a fanboy, but I want to talk about the problems that you have with this game. Number one is, it's not an RPG game. Yeah, I think that we should just sit down and admit that it is not really an RPG game. It's not like Baldur's Gate, it's not like Dragon Age, it's not like Neverwinter Nights. It is not a medievalist fantasy game. It is about, I would say, 70% uh, adventure game and 30% role-playing game. Most of this game you're going to be spending reading, you're going to be spending looking things up, you're going to be spending talking with people. And this wouldn't be a problem, except that it's not voiced. I think if the game were fully voiced, and it would be wonderful if it was re-released and they fully voiced everything, all of the different characters' dialogue. That would be fantastic. But it's got a big problem with that. You have to read and read and read again and again and again. And that's pretty much all you're going to be doing. Okay, it's not all you're going to be doing. It's about 70-75% of what you're going to be doing. But it's a hell of a lot to just sit down and play this game and say, Okay, I'm going to spend the next two and a half hours reading. And I don't think that that approach to a video game necessarily is going to work. It's not going to appeal to anybody. If they're not fans of reading, and I pity those poor fools that are not, then they're not going to want to sit there and read for two and a half hours. And even if they love to read like I do, guess what? You have tons of books to read. Why would you say, I'm going to spend the next two and a half hours reading this book, and then say, wow, I'm done with that, I'm going to play a video game, and... Oh read for the next two and a half hours. Okay, you play video games to kind of take a break from that, and I think that's a problem that this game has. Although admittedly, the dialogue options are interesting. They are fun. You usually get an entire sheet full of dialogue options, of four or five or six of them, sometimes a dozen or fifteen in a couple of rare instances. You have just endless amounts of dialogue options. It's not like the simplified, simplified Mass Effect one where it's good, bad, neutral, or good, bad, funny, which I hate, you know, it, it, it's much more intelligent this way, and I really like it. Uh, however, it's a problem, you know, I can't play this game for long periods of time, especially because I can't really read on a computer screen for too long, it's not something I'm happy with. Uh, I don't have any opposition to it morally, you know, it's, it's not like I'm one of those people that say things have to be on paper and real books, it's just that it kind of it, it really uh, hurts my eyes after too long and can make the game not so fun. And it's also, uh, I think that if they build it more as an adventure game, you're going to spend time talking with people. I think there are only, I think there are only two or three fights in the game that you have to, have to actually fight. You can play the game where you fight everything left and right, although that's not really advised. It's not really a good idea, and you're not getting the full experience if you do. Uh, but you, if you play it intelligently, you can really only end up fighting, I think, like I said, two or three battles in the entire game, which is very strange. And I think that the fact that it's build wrong is, is not a good thing, because like I said, the game is great, but it's that old saying about if you really, really want pizza, and you go into a pizza store and they have the best Chinese food that's ever, that's ever been made in, in existence, well, too bad. You wanted pizza. So you're going to come in there and, and have Chinese food? They said it was pizza. They should say that it's an, an adventure role-playing game, and it, you know, some sort of mixture of the two. And you're going to spend most of your time simply soaking in the sights and sound and people of Sigil, and, and that's what you're going to spend most of your time doing. Let's talk about the interface. Oh my god. I, 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 I just know that I'm going to be creating enemies on every side when I say this, but I despise the inventory, and every interface system in this entire game. And the reason I'm going to be making enemies left and right is that people back then, like me, who grew up starting adventure games in the, let's say, early to mid-90s when I first started playing role-playing games, 
times, uh, are, uh, are sort of defensive, I think, about how crappy a lot of the interface was back then. As much as I loved and played games like Might and Magic and Baldur's Gate and, I mean, Ultima to death back in those games, guess what? Nowadays, compared to the modern system that we have, they're freaking terrible. They're awful. I know I made fun of, uh, of Dragon Age before, but guess what? Their inventory system was leagues, kilometers, was continents away from how crummy this one. It was amazing compared to this one. The inventory system is horrid in this game, and I have to single that out. As I said, it's more of a, an adventure game where you have to collect a lot of items that don't have an immediate use. And since you only have 20 slots in your inventory, plus 5 quick slots, that's only 25 items, guess what? You're going to have to carry tons and tons of stuff. Managing the inventory is part of the gameplay, and it can take forever to do it, and it is ridiculous that you have to spend all of this time. I felt like I was actually fighting the inventory system in this game. And it's not even based on entirely on weight. You actually have, like in most D&D, an encumbrance limit where you can't carry more than that. But you can't find 12 items that could add up to the amount of weight that even a very low-strength character could hold. So it's completely ridiculous. You should have an infinite amount of inventory, or at least inventory up until the point where your encumbrance is met, and it should be automatically divided among all of your people. Having to struggle with this seems like fighting against an antiquated system, and saying this is going to make modern people who, who grew up playing games in the mid-2000s and on, and have never played computer role-playing games before, are going to be agonized about that. So I feel like I'm really stuck in the middle of this fight where I, I, I'm really kind of in this hated position where I'm trying to get people... Uh, on this side, to give these games a chance despite their terrible interface. I'm in the and my old friends who want to defend to the death an antiquated and ridiculous and difficult to use system. So it's not all that easy to do. Uh, you know, you it's more of a point and click adventure game at times, and you should have a very easy to use inventory rather than this complicated mess that you're going to be spending so much time junking stuff, throwing stuff away, keeping stuff. And, yeah, I have to mention something. It's not all BS. It's not all unimportant. It's vitally important because there are some things in the game that you have to hang on to from the earliest point in the game, from sometimes from the first few minutes of the game. You have to hang on to seemingly useless items that have no gameplay RPG function, but have a vitally important adventure game function. Do you remember Angela's Knife in Silent Hill 2? You would never throw that away, not that you can, but, you know, if you have a limited inventory and you can't, and you have to throw something away to pick something up you may need, like a health item, you'd throw it away. Or there are things like that that you should keep the entire game, you know, literally until the very end of the game, and you would naturally just throw them away. So. It's very confusing, very difficult, and needlessly complicated, especially for modern people who have not had to deal with this combative and difficult inventory system. Another problem, uh, I mentioned before it's, not a tr it's more of an art adventure game. Well, guess what? When I first started playing this game over a decade, I think it came out in 98, over a decade ago, 98 or 99, uh, I put it in there and I decided I wanted to be a warrior, and so because I played... Uh, role-playing games before, I decided to give myself a lot of strength and constitution, and very low intelligence, wisdom, and uh, charisma. You know, I had a good amount of strength and constitution and pretty good dexterity. That was really stupid, because I, as I mentioned before, it does, this is, not a, this is not really an RPG game, or as it is an adventure game. Whatever class you play, you should play a wizard, by the way, because that's the easiest to do, and you could pick any three classes and change them within the game, you should max out your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, and they should be in the 20s by the end of the game, because having those conversation options, that's more important than being able to, to actually fight. Most of the time, you should honestly just run away from fights. You really don't need to get involved with them. They are boring, and they are dull, and they're not part of this game. It's not like Baldur's Gate, where it's fun and a vital part of what you're doing. 
this is an adventure game, as I said, and you should be able to talk to people as much as possible. So that charisma, intelligence, and wisdom score is going to give you more dialogue options. And that's what you need to max out. And the game does kind of mention that in the manual, I think, but it doesn't make it clear enough for me when I was playing it. And I ended up with this character that was really unsuited to the game and made it much harder and less interesting than really it should have been in the subsequent playthroughs. I changed that, but still, it might be something that is going to put off people that are trying to play this game. Another problem, again, to do with this being an adventure game, is that there is a lot of BS puzzles in it. BS in terms of an RPG game and not in terms of a puzzle of, a, of an adventure, a point-and-click adventure game. If you think of it in that mindset, everything is going to be a lot easier because things are so much more confusing. You know, it's not like hacking and slashing. It's not like Diablo. In fact, they even make fun of Diablo in the game. Just to give you a, a one example of all of the kinds of puzzles and problems you're going to have to put into the game, Let's talk about how you find one of the characters. Uh, his name is Nordom. He's a rogue Modrom. And Nordom is one of my favorite characters. He is adorable, he is really cool, his dialogue is fun, and he's badass with his double crossbow as an HR. He is really, really cool. And let's talk about how you find Nordom. And please, bear with me, I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. So you start by going to a shop. In the shop you find a strange doll of a Modron. You take the Modron to a bunch of other Modrons that are in a, the brothel. When you talk to them, they tell you it's not just a toy, it's actually a special device that's going to take you to a pocket dimension. If you use the device in a certain way. So you use the device in a certain way and you take it into a pocket dimension. Inside the pocket dimension is a randomly generated dungeon, all of Diablo or games like that, where you have to go into the dungeon, follow it around, go through the random points until you come to a central hub where it's controlled by a bunch of other Modrons. When you talk to those Modrons there, they tell them that they are stuck in here in a strange loop because they've been asked to study hack and slash random dungeon generators and why people like playing them. Meta enough for you? And then after this, you have to set the parameters to the dungeon to the hard mode. It's on easy mode where the enemies become really, really tough, especially for when you first get them. And then you have to go into the dungeon and only go north and west. And if you go north and west and north and west and north and west again and again and again, eventually, if you're lucky enough to be in an only set of rooms where you can go north and west, either you can't go east. I don't know why you would go north and west because there's no dialogue option that tells you why you should. You will eventually come to a room where you find Nordom. But I'm not done. When you find order to talk to him, if you talk to him, you can convince him to come with you. If you convince him to come with you, you better make damn sure that you didn't have a full party of characters with you when you went in there, like the full party you might want to bring with you to fight extremely tough characters in a, a part of the game where you know you might die really easily. Because if you bring an entire full party of characters, you can't bring Norda or you have to leave that character there and leave him there forever and never get them back. Why? Why would they go to all of that freaking rigmarole in order to do this? And there's more puzzles and bullshit about Nordon. I mean, I've heard about hiding... Uh, I I've described adventure game puzzles before as like trying to find a needle in a haystack. But this is like trying to find a needle that's inside of a haystack within a randomly generating group of 10 to 20 barns that are guarded by vicious death robots. Oh, by the way and you don't know that there's a needle to find in the first place, so there's no need to go looking. Yeah, I, I forgot my mantra. I know I've joked about Dragon Age before, but at least they didn't make you go through all these fucking hoops and cryptic bullshit just to get one of the best characters in that fucking game. And you have to go through a lot of other stuff like this. A tip is, do not throw anything out. Just don't. Just keep it all, somehow. Or if you want to uh, throw it out, just put it down in a place where you can retrieve it later. Just remember where it all is. Because you may need it. So we've covered some of the good stuff. This characters, the story, the dialogue, and some of the bad stuff. The fact that it's an adventure game and if you don't want to read for several hours at a time, you're probably not going to like it. Uh, the horrible antiquated interface. And it's not specifically this game. It's Baldur's Gate. It's never uh, not Neverwinter Nights. Uh, Icewind Dale. And the other games in that general area, uh, general time period that Bioware made that all had this problem, but this is part of it too. Uh, the fact that it sort of disguises itself as an RPG game, but it's really adventure, and that sort of disguise is not is going to turn people off when they start playing it. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of cryptic adventure game bullshit inside of it. You know, the uh, Neverwinter Nights had a wonderful button that you could just press, and it would highlight everything in the room, and you can know what you can click on. In this game, you have to play that. You have to play, what can I click on? And you just, you don't know.
and it's it's sometimes really annoying. Uh, for those of you with no experience with this game, what you're really doing is playing on top of a painting. It's everything in the background is sort of a static image that you are your characters are walking across. So there's really no 3D. There's no nothing looking around it, and it may be hard to convince a modern gamer to get into all that. But there are good things. There are bad things. Ultimately, though, all of the bad things are outweighed by how great the game's story is and how wonderful it is to spend time with these characters. And you can go back and back and back and get interested all over again. And the look and the feel and the music of the game is so wonderful. It's perfect. It captures the Planescape setting amazingly. You can even join a couple of factions in the Planescape universe, like the Anarchists and the Dustmen. And all of this has made the richest gaming experience I've ever played. And only a couple other games over the years have ever been more in-depth. Despite all of the problems with the antiquated controls and the cryptic adventure game bullshit, I think that every person should play this game. We should all learn from it. Let's hope to God that more video games in the future are going to be made like this, and not just retro-type games that are in the style of the things back then, but modern 3D games should be made like this. Again, I don't know how they're going to do it, but I think every single person should play this game. It's one of the best I've ever played. It is really easy to obtain now because it was re-released as part of the uh, Dungeons & Dragons collection that they did. They had Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 2, Icewind Dale 1 and 2, uh, Planescape, and I think a couple other games. There's no reason not to play that. It is fantastic, very cheap, heartily recommended. I think everyone should play this game, and it bothers me when I find people that haven't played it and are uh, talking about video games and people who don't want to play it. It's really, really a masterpiece that everybody should play.